John, uh, really, really happy to have you on the peer space this evening on our 15th uh, talk night. Um, to give a little bit of context to John, uh, he has completed his 10,000 hours of working with high-tech startups many, many years back. He spent 12 years working in Silicon Valley and among many different things that he's done with his career, he was board member of the Silicon Valley Association of Startup Entre Entrepreneurs. So John, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Oh, you're welcome. Glad to be here. Um, so John, uh, what I wanted to start with is uh, just ask a little bit about um, how you got started in your career. Can you share a bit about your, your early years with us? Sure. So I got an electrical engineering degree from Purdue, then I got an MBA, and then I went to work in a manufacturing plant and became manager of manufacturing engineering in a magnetic materials manufacturing plant. And so I learned a lot about how job shops work. And uh, then I left there and went to work for a custom computer software company, which was a startup that had just been acquired by ADP. Uh, and I was an account manager and then a district manager in Chicago for them. So I uh, learned what it was like to be in a company that was about 20 million a year in revenue when I joined and growing very quickly. And uh, then I left there after about five years and uh, became first a director, then a vice president in a merger and acquisition unit of uh, International Thomson, what's now Thomson Reuters. And uh, that gave me my first opportunity to be on the board of directors of a startup. And actually, I was one of the founding boards of a board of directors members. And so uh, I got to see the very early end of a startup from a, uh, from a board of directors standpoint. And then after that, I became a consultant and, uh, you know, that's probably the rest of what we're going to talk about. Got it. Yeah. Cause that's what I was going to say was the often people get started in their careers and then um, there's some sense in which they kind of uh, find their groove. So can you tell us a little bit about, sort of where you've maybe found a, a, a per different times you found purpose in your life or particular groove that's, that's worked for you? Sure. When I was with that custom computer software company, I was promoted four times in four years. And so that was interesting times because as soon as I learned how to do one thing, I was then learning how to do something else. And so that, uh, that was finding a groove, but it was a pretty fast paced groove, if you will. Uh, so then when I was in that merger and acquisition unit, um, that started out where on Sunday nights, I would fly from my home in Chicago to Denver, where we were headquartered and I'd spend Denver, uh, Monday in Denver. And then Monday night, my boss and I would fly out to wherever we were going to go and would spend the rest of the week on the road. And then I would, uh, you know, return uh, home Friday night. Um, and I, I did that for two years. So uh, that was a very interesting two years because uh, I learned that when you're, when all the people you're talking to perceive you as the source of money, you can get away with being two hours late for meetings and, uh, and they'll, they'll still be there waiting for you. Uh, it, it was a very interesting experience because of uh, all the different technologies I was exposed to, the different types of people that I was exposed to. And I ended up with a responsibility for reporting on the activities of all of the smaller companies, say less than 1 million in sales worldwide. So there were 10 of those at that time. So I get to, got to visit a lot of those and then figure out how to write an insightful report about that for the worldwide board of directors. So that all to, added up together to be a, a very nice experience. Um, when I was in Silicon Valley, uh, the, that started, started out as sort of a jerky thing. You first get to uh, Silicon Valley, and then you have to prove that you know how to do something. And then it's after you prove you know how to do something, then people accept you. And so uh, about six months after I did that, I was invited to be a member of the board of directors of the Silicon Valley Association of Startup Entrepreneurs. And that was a, a really interesting ride, a, a meeting very interesting people. And then 
I did that for, I think, three years. And then about, uh, about a year later, after I ended that, I became a member of the board of directors of the Silicon Valley Engineering Council, which is the overarching group of, over all of the professional engineering societies in Silicon Valley. I was representing IEEE, the Institute of Electrical Electronics Engineers, but you know, of course we also had the Society of Manufacturing Engineers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that was an interesting different perspective into how life worked uh, within Silicon Valley. And then of course I was working with startups as small as one person and you know, in Silicon Valley, a company is a startup until they do their financial exit. So one of my clients uh, was doing about 50 million a year, but they were planning their IPO for, you know, three years later. So they were still a startup, uh, which is a little different than how people think about startups in, you know, other countries. Uh, and uh, let's see. Oh, um, uh, also in Silicon Valley, I, one of my consulting gigs was to be an advisor to a, uh, strategic venture capital uh, fund within a semiconductor, a Japanese semiconductor company. And that was very interesting because uh, the Japanese, or at least this Japanese company uh, approached this in a very structured, very methodical way. They knew exactly what they wanted to do and they knew how to do it and they were doing it very well. And so, uh, the nice thing about that is one of the things I was supposed to do was develop deal flow. Well, that was very easy to do because what would happen is somebody with a startup would call up the Japanese company and they would say, oh no, you got to talk to John before you can talk to us. And so that meant that everybody was calling me wanting to talk to the Japanese company as opposed to me having to go find them, which you know, made my job a lot easier. Now, I was also trying to find uh, startups in other spaces. I was basically looking for system on a chip startups uh, everywhere that those sorts of startups are, which basically means England, uh, EU, um, the United States, Japan, South Korea, Hong Kong, uh, and there's a few in the rest of the British Commonwealth, but not much. Uh, so that was a very interesting sort of global perspective of the developed world. And so there's uh, five examples for you. Great, great, really great, thanks. Okay, and um, obviously the, the journey in business or from startups through scale up uh, and the journey of sort of growth in business or success in business is not uh, often straightforward. And I was wondering if you could share anything about what you've learned uh, or any insights you have about um, you know, when the going gets tough you know, um, for, for anyone that would be interested in, um, you know, learning from that? Well, uh, a lot of the people who end up in a bad place are doing that because they didn't do their homework before they founded the company. So before you found the company, you can do everything except collect money. And in most places, you can form a company overnight. So there's no reason to really form a company until you know, you're pretty close to wanting to take money from customers. Uh, so you can go out and talk to prospects and you can find out what their market pains are and you can develop your MVP and do all these things that you do with uh, friends and family money, friends, family, and full money. And uh, there's a tremendous amount you can accomplish there. In addition to that, you should be talking to people who know how the process is done so that you understand that you need to have paying customers before you start looking for investors. There's, you know, maybe 10% of startups get to the point of wanting to raise money before they realize that they have to have paying customers before they can effectively raise money. And, you know, that's a major problem for them because by the time they figure that out, Sometimes they're in dire financial straits, which doesn't work out well. Uh, so I would say, you know, learning how the system works by talking to people who've done it before, uh, before you start your startup will help you in a number of ways. It'll help you in that sort of way. And it'll also help you understand which sort of business models are practical and which aren't. Because uh, sometimes people try to do things that are too complex. 
you know, if you do a presentation to an investor and he says, it's too complex, I don't understand it, you might as well give up right there because he's not going to invest. And you really need to figure out how to express it much more simply. And that may be difficult if you haven't been doing that since very early days. Mm. Uh, depends on what you're doing. Uh, but, you know, so the, the basic uh, answer is that if you plan ahead in terms of developing a good team and in terms of understanding what you need to do before you can raise money, and understand the process by which you're going to have an MVP in place, life goes a lot soon, uh, easier because basically if you create something that people wanna buy and you have increasing numbers of people buying it and they're willing to tell your potential investors that you have something that solves a mission critical problem in a growth sector and they love it and they can't do without it, then the investors beat a path to your door. You don't have to go yeah. look for them. They're going to find you. Yeah. And, you know, you can spend your time worrying about all the other things. That makes a, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, completely. Okay. And, 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 would, and if you were, to, if you were to, if you would sort of share three main lessons and let's say talking about um, your experience working with startups and in business, what would be your sort of three big lessons from, from, from all your experiences? Well, I think the one that's most relevant in uh, England and the uh, EU is that in Silicon Valley, uh, all the startup CEOs and the officers are always running around trying to find out how best practices in whatever they're now trying to do have changed so that they can be sure to do that. There is much less focus on best practices in Europe. And I don't really understand why, because they seem to think that Silicon Valley knows a lot and they ought to do things the Silicon Valley way. So maybe they need to spend a little more attention to how Silicon Valley does things because understanding best practices is a good idea. Um, uh, secondly, you, you really need to understand your market. You can never have too much knowledge of your market. Uh, one of uh, the startups I worked with, the guy spent six months walking the streets of San Francisco, going to hair salons, talking to them about a electronic signage system uh, that was going to provide video content to the women who were sitting there waiting to, for their appointments. And so he learned a tremendous amount about the market and how much money they were willing to risk on buying what he had. And so how much he had to put into it to make it work because they weren't willing to put in enough money to pay for the installation that had to be there. And then he could go talk to his investors and say, okay, I spent six months doing this. And so I understand if I hire a sales guy, I can understand how many people he can visit in a day. And I know what percentage of them respond positively to what I do, which is not the same as what percentage will buy, but it's an interesting place to start. So it, uh, understanding your market's a great idea. You can, it's hard to have too much knowledge about your market. And uh, the last thing really bears on what I said before, you know, creating satisfied customers. If you've got something that customers are willing to say, this is great, I love it, it solves a market pain that's mission critical, and we're in a growth industry, then, you know, the investors beat a path to your door, and uh, everything else works out. That, what I just captured there, I just wanted to share it back, was best practices, know your market, and track, and kind of traction. The last one sounds like traction to me. If you've got, if you've got satisfied customers, and, yes, and you that's can true. Profit, profitably acquire them, then you're, you're, you're on a good track. Okay, great. And, and just before we open it up to the floor, so everyone prepare yourselves for, with your questions. Um, or if you have any, please put them in the chat. Um, John, if you were to say now, what's your sort of purpose, mission now, looking ahead? Uh, what's your what's your sort of uh, and how how can people um, reach out to you if you like? Um, yeah, can you share a bit about that? Well, I think you basically go through a number of stages in your career, and I'm now in the stage which uh, you know myself and my friends refer to as the stage where you get to do the fun stuff. In other words, we're doing the things that we want to do, and uh, in my case, I really like uh, working with early stage entrepreneurs. So I. Uh, coach 
early stage entrepreneurs, one of the incubators I've been coaching there ever since I moved to uh, Europe. And uh, there's another incubator, which is a virtual incubator for black owned startups where I'm the entrepreneur in residence. And I do monthly programs with the, the entrepreneurs that are. So I, I enjoy doing that. I would like to find time to write more white papers uh, because I see that as a very useful way to give back information. Uh, there's three of those on my website that you can access for free. And uh, I'd, I'd like to do more of that. But, you know, I've been saying that for several years and I haven't had time to do it yet. Can, can I ask, sneakily as a first additional question, what it is about working with early stage entrepreneurs that appeals particularly? Oh, okay. They're very smart people. They have a well-defined mission. They're high energy and uh, they're, they don't waste your time with things that don't matter. They, they understand what's important and they uh, want you to help them get there faster and better. And you know, that's fun. Great. Great. John, thanks very much. That's the, the official bit over. So we can open up to the floor now uh, to any questions or comments on that. If anyone would like to, no one ever wants to go first. So does anyone like to have a, have a question for John or, or a comment? Yeah, I'll ask. Oh, okay. right, yeah, go. Yeah, um, I, I did say what John says. I, I, I work with businesses and I find that a lot of them do not ask or try and find out what's best practice. So I'm going through speaking to a business. I'm working with a business now. And I've told him, I'm, I'm not a benchmarking person. I don't think you benchmark, you go to the benchmark. Go and find out what's good practice. Find out where are you against that good practice. And they're reluctant to do it. Now, I'm similar to John. I'm from a manufacturing kind of background. And I find, I just want to know from John, why does he think that Europeans, especially engineers and manufacturers, are very reluctant to ask for help and find out what is the practice? They'd rather firefight for then go and find out what's good and then go and be better. Well, I think that one thing you might consider in looking at these companies that you work with is to think about whether the CEO is a directive person or a facilitator. If they're a facilitator, then you probably don't get much change in a good direction. Whereas if they're directive, uh, and if the CEO understands how to work with people, you know, he can identify certain areas that have this problem, different area has another problem, then he can work with, you know, each vice president in a different way to address something else in order to grow the business. And I remember reading a book a number of years ago where a guy was hired, I think, to be president of uh, Avis. And uh, the board member who uh, hired him said, you know, you're going to have to replace all the vice presidents. And three years later, the same board member came back and realized that all of the same vice presidents were still there, only they were performing at a much higher level because this guy really had leadership skills and empowered people to do things. So uh, I would suggest to you that uh, there's, there's certainly people in any country who want to work harder and there's some who want to work less. And uh, I, I think the uh, one of the key aspects that can be helpful to you in considering who you want to work with is to look at that CEO and decide whether he's facilitating or directive and which you think is most appropriate for that point in the evolution of that company. Right. Do you think there's an underlying cultural thing in Europe where we're reluctant to ask? I'm sorry, please repeat that. Do you think there's an underlying cultural thing in Europe where businesses are reluctant to ask? Reluctance to ask in Europe for help. I don't understand it. I don't know, because you take England, for example, and England has a multi-hundred year history of uh, executives going all over the world, either as a part of the military or as a part of private enterprise. And... Uh, you know, forming new businesses in India or Australia or wherever it was. And so I, I would, you know, think that certainly indicates a long history of people being willing to act. And you've got, 
other countries such as Germany and Belgium and France who, who've done similar sorts of things, uh, not uh, perhaps in as many different countries, but very effectively in a number of countries. So uh, I, I think you're asking a very interesting question, but uh, I don't see Europeans as being, you know, afraid to act. I see them as being less likely to ask for help from people outside of their normal sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that would be helpful if they would do more of that. Great. Thanks for that question, Valpas. Great. Uh, anyone else have a question or comment? Uh, Phil? Um, do you see uh, much of a difference in terms between Silicon Valley and uh, the rest of the world? But I'm thinking more from a, a British point of view uh, in um, people's willingness to take risks. Well, you know, all Europeans think that Silicon Valley guys are willing to take much more risks than European investors are, but I don't think that's necessarily true. Um, to comment about your statement about differences, uh, when I first moved to Silicon Valley, uh, I remember thinking, you know, when I'd been there maybe three months or something like that, I remember thinking, I've got to write down how it's different because it's so different here than it was in Chicago or Virginia, where I had most of my adult experience. But I didn't bother to do that. And then after I'd been there about a year and a half, I thought about that again. And I realized I could no longer remember the differences in a way to be able to describe them in a useful way. Um, I think that, in fact, uh, if you want to create an, a really large, really successful uh, company like a Facebook or a Google, I think that you probably have to do that in Silicon Valley because of the depth of everything in the infrastructure that is going to make sure you need what you want. I mean, in Silicon Valley, if you need a piece of advice on a topic you've never thought about before, either a friend or a friend of a friend knows somebody who's a world-class expert who lives in Silicon Valley and you call up the guy and invite him to lunch and, you know, figure out whether or not you want to hire him or whether he can just tell you what you need to know at lunch. So, you know, you can't do that in small towns in Northern Vermont. You know, it, it's uh, pretty unique to the larger ecosystem. Some countries have startup ecosystems where they have fewer people who have had successful financial exits. And so there's fewer people helping the young people who are growing up understand what the whole entrepreneurial thing is before uh, they even think about whether or not they want to do a startup. And so a, a place like uh, Silicon Valley or Shanghai or Berlin or Cambridge or Oxford has a real advantage over other places. I think that Cambridge and Oxford have stronger startup ecosystems than London, uh, which is part of what I'm saying. Um, if you're doing a more average startup, you know, one that's maybe going to be doing, say, $60 million a year in revenue in year five, then I think it's actually easier to get funding for that and easier to be successful and fewer predators trying to take whatever they can from you in London or Berlin or some other European citizen, uh, cities in comparison to Silicon Valley, where uh, there's a lot of predators circling overhead. Thanks, John. That's great. Um, more questions? We've probably got time for a few more questions uh, or comments. Anyone else like to throw something in? Um, um, how do you develop your white papers? Where do they come from? Do they come from the experience of working with the businesses or from just your kind of general networking and you know what you deliver as your services to you know, your clients? Well, the first one happened because of a very unique situation that I saw. I took a company into an investor and the investor invested and within a year, the startup CEO had proven to be a very problematic 
and the investor refused to invest more money. And so I saw the process by which all of the existing investors gave up and he had to go find new investors. And the new investors then did um, what's called a cram down in Silicon Valley. They basically said, okay, you guys all owned 100% of the equity in the past. Now you own 10% and we've got the other 90% because we're willing to put the money in. And of course we're gonna give uh, some equity to the key people who are working here, but you guys who gave up don't deserve much. And so you essentially have a macho game where the existing investors and the key people in the company and the new investors are, are going through that, trying to figure out. Anyway, I saw that. I was fascinated. So I got together with a few friends of mine and we wrote a white paper about how that process works. Um, I had been giving startups advice about how to put together business plans and pitch decks for their first funding round. And I was tired of giving them advice and having them not pay attention and having to repeat it and so forth. So I decided to write a white paper. So I wrote a white paper on how you do that. And by the way, in each of my white papers, I recruited an editorial review board to review it and uh, help bring it up to the next level. In the case of this one I'm describing now, I had 15 people uh, who were all uh, part of the startup investor, early stage investor community. And we were arguing about things in the white papers because I'd previously published other things. So I knew how to recruit editorial review board members who would actually work. And so, you know, in my opinion, that's one of the reasons it's a much better white paper. The third white paper, um, I co-founded an activity within a consultants association in Silicon Valley. I was on the board and I thought some of our members really didn't understand the business aspects of being a consultant. So uh, we created an activity that was simultaneous uh, webinars and uh, you know, people in the seat seminars uh, at, the, at the same time um, to teach people the different aspects of uh, what was important from a business perspective of, of being a consultant. And so when I was going to give a presentation in, you know, maybe event number six or something like that, I was going to co-present something with one of the other board members. And we thought about it. We thought, hey, a white paper would be a good idea. And when we said that, we were only like 30 days away from the date. So we had to write it in less than 30 days. And so we did. And whereas the other ones took a lot longer. And uh, so that one was you know, created through that set of circumstances. And I find that those sorts of reasons for writing something are really convenient because they sort of focus your attention as to what to do. And so uh, over the last few years, as I thought about writing another white paper, I've started maybe three different focal points and uh, you know, I think the real reason they didn't get finished is because they just didn't light my fire like those other three. Yeah, and I do think you have to have that connection as well, don't you? I mean, some of them, when they come out of your own experience as well, it's quite a, um, a cathartic and quite a rich experience because you're able to sort of relate to your own personal experience as well. And the insight that gives you reflect on other, other situations you've been in as well. Does it still hold true when you've got a, a body of work to re refer back to? Uh, that's true. In my case, one of my problems is that because I've worked with thousands of startups, yeah. um, I have to decide what is the focus of a set of information that's going to make sense to somebody who's very early in the stage. And of course, mm -hmm. I don't remember what it's like to be very early in the stage. So I have to go out and interview people and mm -hmm. find out what they're thinking. On the point of um, uh, white papers, I just want to say, if you share my your email with me personally, um, I will send you a white paper from John that he shared with me before the uh, before the session, uh, one of his white papers. So, oh, Rav, bye. Sorry, you have to leave us, yeah. Bye, Rav. Good to see, good to see All you. right, lovely to meet you. Bart, did you want to come in? Yeah, is, is there still time for one? Okay, yeah, ciao. Okay. I think it's probably a final, final question from Bart. Final question, maybe... Uh, 
yeah. Uh, John, from all your experience with startups and scale up uh, companies, um, what would be your advice or what would be your your vision on um, ideal starting teams and and or ideal first hires in a uh, growing startup? What was the first one? The second one was first hires, but what was the first uh, a f- starting team? So the what would be the there? There are lots of different like rules, like you need a uh, a hustler and so on f- to get started. But from your experience, what would be the ideal team of people to get started? What kind of roles, functions? Investors really like to invest in teams that have worked together before and where each of them has been involved in launching a new product to the same sector that you're currently trying to launch one to. So if you put together a group of like-minded people, uh, you know, with similar backgrounds and you've worked together with them or something like that, then you can uh, create uh, something that matches those sorts of things fairly easily. Uh, As one example, um, while I had that contract with that semiconductor company, uh, there was a startup that approached me and they said, uh, we are half of the executive team of this other company and we have left them and we have um, licensed new technology from an organization in Switzerland. So there's no intellectual property issues with our prior employer. And we've all worked together uh, launching products uh, in this particular aspect of semiconductors in the past. So, you know, we knew how to do this. So I took them into my client and my client said, you know, he was impressed with many things, but he said, uh, you want us to be a partner where you're saying that we need to commit $40 million to do this. And he said, three years ago, we threw away $140 million that we had spent trying to do another $40 million partnership with somebody else. And he said, the, uh, the board doesn't have the appetite for that now. So sorry about that. Uh, and ultimately that group uh, ended up getting funded by Intel, which of course was a very good thing, but it, it probably took them three years to get funded by Intel. And uh, I mean, excuse me, three years from the time they started trying to raise money until the time they actually you know, had the whole package put together with Intel. Uh, which is longer than you would normally expect it to take, but it ended up being a very successful relationship. Right. Uh, so did I answer the right question? <laughs> uh, I, I would still have more questions about first hires and all, but I don't want to stall the process too long for now. Well, okay, just to say something <laughs> briefly, you need to figure out a plan about how your startup is going to grow so that you have the right team in place for various events. One of those events is going to be when you're trying to figure out how to build the MVP. Another one of those is when you're trying to raise your first seed round. And another one is say the second seed round and the A round and so forth. And you need different people in place for all of those. For example, you really have to have an advisory board in place in order to raise your first seed round. By the time you get to the first A round, the investors are assuming that you've got all the right vice presidents in place where you don't really need those advisors. They don't care if you still have some of them, that's not a problem, but you better have a strong uh, team of officers at that point. What you need first really depends a lot on what you're doing. Uh, Generally speaking, you do not need a COO, you do not need a CFO, uh, so, you know, the startups that have those, it's sort of like the investors are going to say, why are you here? Uh, because when you're this small, you don't need those things. And what you do need varies. For example, if you're doing a fabulous chip startup, all you really need is a technical guy and a biz dev guy. And one of those might be the CEO. Uh, so you can have a very small team. Whereas if you were doing a, an e-commerce site, where you needed good technology and good marketing, you know, you're going to be looking for a different team. So what you have to have depends on what you're trying to do. I'm not worried about time. I'm just going to jump in so it doesn't become a consulting session. That's uh, no, all right. It's but, all right. Um, Thanks a lot. No, it's fine. It's fine. 
I, w I really wanted to ask one one other question, which is about um, the characteristic characteristic the one characteristic of the most successful startup entrepreneurs or the most successful entrepreneurs. What would you say? Uh, well, actually, some people have done some research, which makes it easy to answer that question. And so the the startup entrepreneurs who are the CEOs of the successful unicorns, back when they founded the startup, were about 40 years old and had previously had a significant management job, usually in sales, marketing, or biz dev, um, in a well-run company. So that they learned all those things about how management and so forth worked. They didn't have to learn those after you know, they got into the startup. Uh, so as, as an example of that, um, I had a client who had worked for Goldman Sachs, and then he had left Goldman Sachs to start a startup. So he had family money. So at the early end, he could do things with more autonomy and not need investors on board. He could do some things that were expensive that allowed that you know, first proof of concept to happen in an area where it was expensive to accomplish that. But he didn't need to go to one of these startup boot camps, which mostly teach you, uh, you know, the sorts of management things that he already knew. And so he was using me to tell him the things about what was going to happen in the startup life cycle, which he was less familiar with, and what he needed to be preparing to do um, in the you know, normal sequence of things. But he, he already had the management part down very well. John, I just want to wrap up the uh, the formal part of the session and thank you very much for, for coming along and uh, being part of this and being open to the uh, the interactive part of the session as well. Thanks very much. Well, thank you. I appreciate being here. It was fun.